Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. What a sermon title. I'm kind of a big deal. Uh, Pastor Craig's usually pretty good about getting us our, our themes a month or two in advance. When I first read that, I thought, you know, I've heard that before, but I wasn't sure where I had heard it before. So I went to the smartest person I know. His name is Google. And I typed in, I'm kind of a big deal. And like the first page is a 28-second video clip from a movie that I've never seen called The Anchorman. It's apparently stars Will Ferrell. He's, uh, he's a newscaster named Ron Burgundy in San Diego. And uh, this clip I'm going to show you, and by the way, after the uh, 519 last night, everybody said, don't see it, Steve. It's not a good movie. You wouldn't like it. But this section is good, and, and it's where this quote is from, so let's fire this up. Well, you certainly know how to compliment a woman. Now, if you'll excuse me. Do you know who I am? No, I, I can't say that I do. I don't know how to put this, but I'm kind of a big deal. Really? People know me. Well, I'm very happy for you. I'm very important. Uh, I have many leather-bound books, and my apartment smells of rich mahogany. <laughs> He thinks he's a big deal because people know him and he has these possessions. Well, throughout this Lenten season, if you've been here the last five weeks, we're, we're into this liar, liar, the truth behind the lies that you and I believe. In the litany that we just read together a little bit ago, in John 8, 44, Jesus stares down the devil and says, you are the father of lies, and contrasting that with God, who, of course, is the truth. And so the challenge this morning is not to debunk the statement, are you a big deal? Are you kind of a big deal? You are a big deal. What we're going to try to debunk this morning, though, is why it is that you are indeed a big deal. You know, we come out of the womb acting like we're a big deal. Psalm 51.5 says it this way, man, I was sinful at my birth. I was even sinful from the time that my mother conceived me. We come out of the womb thinking we're a big deal. Did any of you parents have to sit your kids down when they were 18 months old or two years old and teach them how to pout and cry and stomp their feet? If things didn't go their way, of course not. You didn't have to teach them, right? We call that original sin. They came out of the womb thinking that the world revolves around them. I'm even convinced, having raised three children, that the word toddler comes from a German word that means tiny dictator. Because they just think they are everything, that they are everything in the world revolves around them. I found these 10 toddler rules that I think sums up kind of how they think they're a big deal. Toddler rule number one is this. If it's mine, it's mine. Number two, if it's yours, it's mine. Number three, if I like it, it's mine. Number four, if it's in my hand, it's mine. Number five, if I can take it from you, it's mine. Number six, if I had it a little while ago, it's mine. Number seven, if I'm doing something or building something, all the pieces are mine. Number eight, if it just looks like mine, it's mine. Number nine, if I saw it first, it's mine. And number 10, if you're playing with something and you put it down, it's mine. <laughs> Kids think they are kind of a big deal. A number of years ago, there was a mother making pancakes for her children. The, the boys' names were Ryan and Jordan. They were five and three, and I realize they're the same names of my kids, but there's no way this happened in my house. It's just purely coincidental about this story. So the mom's making pancakes, and the boys are arguing over who's going to get the first pancake. So the mother hears the argument. She says, you know what? I think I'll use this as a teaching lesson. I'll teach a little Christian object lesson with these kids. And she goes up to the two boys, and she says, you know, if Jesus were here, he would say, let my brother have the first pancake. So Jordan 5 turns to Ryan 3 and goes, hey, Ryan, you be Jesus. <laughs> That's just how we are. We think we're kind of a big deal, and we think we're the most important people in the world. And it frankly doesn't get any better. We get into high school and we get into our adult lives and we just saw in the scriptures that we kind of come out of the womb thinking we're a big deal and that the world praises us through middle school and high school and into our adult lives for all the accolades and achievements as we get older and they start pumping us up that, hey man, I'm kind of a big deal. And I'm sure if I took the time right now to pass the microphone around to this very illustrious group today, we'd see some folks with some pretty impressive accomplishments that they've done over the course of their lifetime. I have no doubt we have college graduates in here. I have no doubt we have people who have earned graduate degrees in here. I'm sure we have a valedictorian or two, an employee of the month in here, all conference athletes, accomplished artists, 
people with impressive titles at work who have gotten them through hard work and promotions. Moms and dads sitting in here who have raised some impressive children who have gone on to do some amazing things. Entrepreneurs who have boldly launched and successfully led new companies. People with beautiful musical gifts. People perhaps recognized for being an outstanding volunteer somewhere. Contest winners. And I'm sure the list goes on and on. And the lie that we buy into is that we're kind of a big deal because of what we've accomplished. The wealth we have, the power, the position, our appearance, our influence, or our talents. And then Jesus comes along in Matthew chapter 5. It's the first time Jesus spoke publicly. It's the longest sermon in scriptures, right? We call it the Sermon on the Mount. These are the first words out of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. He flips this whole thing upside down. And he says, you know who's blessed? You know who's going to inherit the kingdom of heaven? The poor in spirit. Poor in spirit means humble. Jesus doesn't say, blessed are the people who have all these accolades and accomplishments that we just went over. He says, blessed are those who are humble and turns this thing completely on its head. Jesus says, to be a big deal, you got to be the littlest deal. And later in Matthew chapter 18, the disciples come up to Jesus and they say, hey, 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 Jesus, who, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? You know, probably us 12, right? Jesus sees a little kid. He goes, hey, hey, Ronnie, come over here. This little boy walks over and Jesus says to the disciples, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like this little child, you're never, ever going to enter the kingdom of heaven. To be a big deal, you got to be the littlest deal. Mark chapter 10, James and John come by, hey, Jesus, hey, you know when we get in your kingdom of glory, can I kind of sit at your left, my brother can sit at your right, kind of be your right-hand man? Jesus says, go get the other 10 guys, and he gets the disciples around him. He says, guys, whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be a slave to everyone else. For even the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. To be a big deal, you got to be the littlest deal. And then in John chapter 13, Jesus does the unthinkable. Jesus gathers those 12 nut jobs, his disciples, and he washes their feet. Now, the foot washer was a role reserved for the lowliest of the servant back then, to clean those dusty feet, right? Walking along those roads, that was for the lowliest servant. And Jesus says to those 12 guys, he says, Guys, now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. I've given you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Because to be a big deal, you got to be the littlest deal. Consider the epistle lesson that Diana just read for us a few minutes ago out of Philippians chapter 2. Do nothing out of self-ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, didn't consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Instead, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Check out verse 6. He didn't consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. He was fully God and fully man. We know that and we believe that. But Jesus surrendered the rights to fully use the rights he had as God. He surrendered the rights to the rights of God when he became a man. He made himself nothing. It says he emptied himself of significance. See, humans, we kind of have this I'm kind of a big deal attitude, and, and we don't want to be emptied. We want to be filled. We're more interested in becoming something or someone than becoming nothing or no one. We want to be more, not less. And then Jesus comes along, it says, and he emptied himself of those rights. And if that's not incredible enough, go to verse 7. Verse 7 could have said, to me it would have been amazing if it said, you know, he took on the very nature of a human being. I mean, here's God coming down. He takes on the very nature of a human being. But it says, not just a human being, he became a servant, it says in verse 7. Jesus became a servant. God became a slave. This, this doesn't compute. I mean, the more you think about it, the more staggering 
it becomes. God became a slave. Nothing in all of fiction, and I used to teach American literature, nothing in all of fiction is as fantastic as the incarnation. God became not just a human, but God became a slave. Jesus, the Son of God, went as low as he could possibly go. And then to top it off in verse 8, it says he became obedient to death on a cross. And it's very difficult for us, I think, in the 21st century to wrap our heads around that. He who made all men, who had authority over all men, who knew the hearts of all men, allowed men to kill him. And it wasn't just any execution, it was death on a cross, it says in verse 8. See, back then, people didn't view the cross the way you and I do. People back then didn't put crosses on gold chains or wear them as earrings or stick diamonds in them and wear them as jewelry. Could you imagine today if somebody took an electric chair and put some little cute diamonds on it and wore it around or a big old syringe from lethal injection and put diamonds on it and wore it? I mean, that's what we're talking about here. People would not have done that back then. The cross was brutal. It wasn't just a form of execution. It was the lowest. It was the most disgusting. It was the most painful. It was the most humiliating way we had found as human beings to kill people in that time. It was reserved for the lowest class of criminals. But it's on the cross that the nature of God is revealed because God is love, and that's why he came, to empty himself out for us, to pour himself out for us, to die for us, to die at our hands because that's what it took to redeem us, to buy us back from the condemnation that our sins had earned. See, for a Christian, the cross is simultaneously paradoxical, right? It's the ugliest thing in the world, and yet it's the most beautiful. It's the most violent thing in the world, and yet it's the most peaceful. It's the most hellish thing on earth, and yet it's the most heavenly. You and I were bought at an incredible price. It cost Jesus, the Son of God, everything. What an incredible distance he journeyed from heaven to the cross, from robes to rags, from being exalted to being executed, from the golden streets of heaven to the dusty cobblestones of the Via Della Rosa, from the heavenly chorus to the cries of an angry mob to crucify him, from heaven's throne down to Bethlehem manger. I mean, it just goes on and on, the paradox that Jesus went through it. And why did he do it? To be obedient? Yes, verse 8 says, but he did it to be obedient because of the deep, sacrificial, unconditional, merciful love that he has for you and for me and for all of mankind. And even more stunning, as Romans 5, 8 reminds us, he did it while we were still sinners. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He did it when we were at our lowest. He was at his best. God loved us in our darkest hours. It doesn't say, hey, but God demonstrates his own love for this and this. Uh, he loved us because we're kind of a big deal. It says, no, you're, you're, we're not a big deal. And, and he loved us anyway. That's the incredible news about the gospel. We're a big deal because God loves us no matter what. And the scriptures are full of examples about how God makes us a big deal. Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, what? Who loved me and who gave himself up for me. You want to know why you and I are big deals? Because he loves us, and he gave himself up for us. Ephesians 2, 4 and 5, love this verse. But because of his great love for us, you want to know why you're a big deal? Because of his great love for us, God who was rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. Big fancy word for sin, right? We were dead in transgressions, and he loved us anyway, and he made us alive. It is by grace you've been saved. You want to know why you're a big deal? Because God saved us because of his grace. 1 John 4, 9 and 10. This is how God showed his love among us. Love this verse. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. We're a big deal because he sent his son by, to be an atoning sacrifice for us. If you have any bad memories from elementary school and being picked last on the kickball field at recess, I got good news for you. You're actually a first-round draft pick. You're actually a first-round draft pick. Jeremiah 1.5 says it this way. 
Before I even formed you in the womb, God said, I knew you, and before you were born, I picked you first. I knew you were going to be this sinful bag, this pathetic bag of sinful goo. I knew it. But I picked you anyway. I set you apart, and I picked you first in the very first round. He knew how we were going to turn out. He had read the back of the book. He knew that we were going to think and do and say all kind of horrific things. And he said, I picked you first anyway because I love you, because you're a big deal. That's why Christ came. You and I are big deals to God. We're big deals because we're redeemed, forgiven, adopted, children of God. We're big deals to him because of what he's done for us. Remember, he chose us. He loved us first. He died for us. I, I call that Christ esteem. I mean, that, that's why we're big deals. We have Christ esteem because of what he did for us on that cross 2,000 years ago and in that empty tomb. We're valued and precious, not because of things we've done and accomplished, but because of what Christ has accomplished for us and because of who we are, baptized and unconditionally loved children of God. So it's not a lie. You are a big deal. Amen.